Everyone, please stand. We will be singing Battle Hymn of the Republic. Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. He is trampling out the vintage where the grapes of wrath are stored. He hath loosed the faithful lightning of his terrible swift sword. He is Good morning. I'm glad that you're here with us today. Welcome to Bible Baptist Church for our uh, morning worship service. Uh, happy Independence Day uh, holiday. Uh, it's good to see so many folks in red, white, and blue uh, today. And I want to remind you tonight, we're going to have a service tonight. Our teens are going to take it as they, uh, as they tell us about camp this past week. But this morning, I want us to read as we begin, uh, I want us to start in Psalm 33. I think this is a good passage. We hear, I'm going to reference a couple passages that we normally hear, especially this time of year, Psalm 33 and uh, Proverbs 14. But I want to read not just Psalm 33, verse 12, but I want to read an extended section of that, Psalm 33, verses 8 through 22. You can follow along on the screen behind me, or you can follow along from your scriptures. But you follow along as I read this aloud. I think this would be a good focus for us as we start today. So God's Word says, Let all the earth... Fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. For he spake and it was done. He commanded and it stood fast. The Lord braineth the counsel of the heathen to naught. He maketh the devices of the people of none effect. The counsel of the Lord stands forever. The thoughts of his heart to all generations. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, is this Lord, and the people whom he has chosen for his own inheritance. The Lord looketh from heaven he beholdeth all the sons of men. From the place of his habitation, he looketh upon all the inhabitants of the earth. He fashioneth their hearts alike. He considereth all their works. There is no king saved by the multitude of an host. A mighty man is not delivered by much strength. A horse is a vain thing for safety. Neither shall he deliver any of his great strength. Behold, the eye of the Lord is upon them that fear him, upon them that hope in his mercy." to deliver their soul from death, to keep them alive in famine. Our soul waits for the Lord. He is our help and shield. For our heart shall rejoice in him because we have trusted in his holy name. Let thy mercy, O Lord, be upon us according as we hope in thee. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, that is our prayer. Let your mercy, O Lord, be upon us according as we hope in you. And I pray, Father, that that is where our hope will rest. Not in uh, a multitude of a host or our own strength or our own abilities, uh, a military uh, 
or any other thing that we might have in which we might boast. Father, may our boast, may our confidence be in Christ and in Christ alone. And so, Father, as we worship you today and on this particular Lord's Day, as we also uh, remember as Americans uh, and celebrate as Americans uh, our independence, the freedoms that we enjoy, which we, which we recognize uh, come from you, uh, Father, uh, may our hearts and minds be renewed and, re, uh, and reinvigorated for a desire to make much of you and to hope only in you. And it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. You may be seated. In just a moment, we're going to have a special that we've been waiting on. Uh, I've been really excited about for a while, but I'll, I do want to share something with you before uh, they sing. And I'm going to uh, call on, uh, we're going to have another prayer in a moment. But I, I, just, I just want to say this that um, Mark Twain wrote that citizenship is what makes a republic. Monarchies can get along without it, but what keeps a republic on its legs is good citizenship. And, and I, I want to stress that good citizenship is not just voting during election times, although I think it is that, but it is being a God-fearing uh, citizen, one who, uh, one who uh, respects his fellow, uh, his neighbors and his fellow citizens, one who respects their property, one who also honors those who protect our freedoms, not just abroad, but, uh, but particularly those who keep the peace at home. And I'm thinking of those people today in particular. I'm sure you've paid attention to the news. It was tragic to hear. I, I didn't find out on Thursday. Uh, I, I read about this on Friday. Uh, but right in eastern Kentucky, I think it's Floyd County. I know it's Prestonsburg. I get my counties confused some. But in that Prestonsburg area, uh, three police officers were shot and killed. Uh, three others were injured, and a canine was, uh, three police officers were actually murdered, and a canine was killed. Uh, and doing their, uh, performing their duty, and three were injured. And so uh, I think one of the best ways that we can celebrate our freedom this particular holiday is to recommit ourselves, if we need to, to being God-fearing citizens, but also to, to honor uh, and remember and pray for those, especially in our own state, just here recently, who have lost their lives serving uh, to protect uh, our freedoms and keep the peace in our community. The freedoms that we enjoy uh, come with a price tag, and that price has to be paid by every generation. And uh, the freedoms that we enjoy are granted to us from God, but there is work to do to maintain it on our own level uh, and in so many other levels as well. So let's go to the Lord in prayer right now. I'm going to pray for those families. I also ask you to pray for a, a few families in our church, specifically Noreen McClure, had a bad break of her ankle uh, late last week, and she's had surgery already, going to have another surgery on Thursday. Uh, I'd ask you to pray for her uh, and, uh, and also pray for uh, Sean's mom, uh, Jerry Burdett, and we've been praying for Jada James. That's Carl and Connie Miller's granddaughter. She's out of the hospital but not out of the woods. So let's pray for those three individuals in specific and also for those families out uh, in the Prestonsburg area who this Independence Day uh, are without their loved ones. But let's go ahead and have a word of prayer right now. Billy Wayne, would you lead us in prayer, brother? Our Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning. We just thank you for the freedom that we do have, Father. We know freedom is free. We just uh, ask, Father, that you be with all of the service men and women around the world today, Father, that you just, uh, keep them safe. Be with the service here this morning, Father. May you be glorified in everything that's said to Most of all, there might be one here that don't know you as the personal Savior. That this might be the very day that they realize and that you can be saved, Father. Thank you for your love and for your and forgiveness. We'll give you the praise for all. In Jesus' name, amen. together in spirit in faith and unity we're the bonds of peace of acceptance and love are the fruits of his presence here among us so with one voice we'll sing to the lord and with one 
his word till the whole earth sees the redeemer has come for he dwells in the presence of his people oh how good it is to impurity we share to rejoice with the happy and weep with to mourn for the weak find strength the afflicted find grace when we offer the blessings of belonging so with one voice we'll sing to the Lord and with one heart we'll live out his word till the whole the Redeemer has come, for He dwells in the presence of His people. Oh, how good it is to embrace His command, to prefer one another, forgive as He forgives when we live as one. We all share in the love of the Son with the Father and the Spirit. So with one voice we'll sing to the Lord, and with one heart we'll live out His Word till the whole earth sees the Redeemer. Everyone, please stand again. We'll be singing America the Beautiful.
Let's pray before we take our seats. Father, we thank you for the blessings uh, that you have given us uh, as individuals and as a nation. We thank you most of all for the, for the grace of Jesus Christ that's available to all who will repent and believe. And then it's our privilege, Father, to, uh, as local churches and as followers of Christ, to wave that banner and to be identified above all other identifiers as followers of Jesus Christ. And so, Father, I pray that that will be our passion and our, uh, and our desire. And we will never live that out perfectly. There will be times when we get on Bypath Meadow. There will be times when we spend a while in uh, Doubting Castle and, and in uh, the Caves of Despair. But, Father, help us to uh, have our eyes turned on Christ and renewed by your Holy Spirit and uh, our feet and our path lit by the truth of your word uh, so that by your grace and according to your mercies, we can recover from those moments and continue on in the path that you have set us. Father, we pray right now for those requests that I mentioned earlier. We also lift up to you, Brother William. Uh, he is as faithful as the, uh, as the son. Uh, and we miss him today because he's preparing for his surgery, has to have his COVID test in preparation for his surgery on Tuesday, uh, a, a major surgery, Father. We praise you. We have always find the good and praise it. And we praise you that uh, there is, uh, that the, it's not cancerous, you know, the polyps that they found. Uh, but we also recognize the, the severity of the surgery to remove parts of that colon. And so, Father, we hold him up to you, and we pray for that family, and we, uh, we just pray that that will go well, and the recovery will be uh, 100%. And we look forward to when he can be back with us. Uh, you are a good and a gracious God, and your grace and goodness has been shed abroad onto this nation in a very uh, unique and powerful way. And so, Father, help us not to take it for granted, uh, and help us to use our freedom responsibly for your glory. And it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. And I'd like you to uh, uh, open your Bibles, first of all, to the book of Daniel. I'm not going to exposit Daniel chapter 2. I just want to uh, read Daniel chapter 2 as a further frame of reference. Psalm 33 and Daniel 2 are going to frame what, uh, what we're talking about this morning in our, uh, in our time of worship about God has blessed uh, this land. It continues to bless it. But I, it needs to be framed by Psalm 33, which we read at the start, and Daniel 2, which I'm about to read now. I'm not going to read. Uh, I've really debated with myself about reading this whole entire chapter, but I'm not going to do that. In fact, I'm going to pick out a section. We're going to read verses 14 through 28, and then verses 36 through 37. And I'm going to set it just, so, just to refresh you about what's going on here. Daniel and his friends, there's more than just these four, but these friends and specifically, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, that's their Hebrew names. Uh, Belteshazzar is Daniel's Babylonian name given to him by the Babylonians. And then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were the Babylonian names given to Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. You're probably more familiar with those names than the others. But they've been ripped from their homes. They've been taken captive from the land of Judah and carried away to Babylon and went through Babylon uh, University so that they could learn the language and the customs and be used uh, for the benefit of the Babylonian Empire, the empire that destroyed their nation and, and destroyed the temple and carried away all the, uh, uh, the implements of the temple. And in Daniel chapter 2, uh, Nebuchadnezzar, the emperor, uh, is, he's had a dream that's troubled him. And he wants, he wants this class of people, which Daniel, Hanani, Mishael, and Azariah were a part of, the, 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 um, the gifted. They're called uh, astrologers and wise men in, in this text, the soothsayers even. He, he wanted them to not only interpret the dream, but to be sure that they could do it well to tell him what the dream was before they interpreted it. Because he didn't trust them. And I can understand that. So tell him what the dream was and then interpret the dream. Well, of course, nobody can do that. Nobody can do that. Uh, uh, and so in his anger, he was going to have that whole cadre of people executed. That's where we pick it up in verse 14. Then Daniel an uh, answered with counsel and wisdom to Arioch, the captain of the king's guard, which was gone forth to slay the wise men of Babylon. And he, said, he answered and said to Arioch, the king's captain, why is the decree so hasty from the king? Why, why is he about to execute us all? 
And then Arioch made the, king, made the thing known to Daniel. And then Daniel went in and desired of the king that he give them time, and that he would show the king the interpretation. He asked for a reprieve. And then Daniel went to his house and made the thing know. He made the situation known to Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, his companions, that they would desire, that they would pray to God for his mercies, that the desire, the mercies of the God of heaven concerning this secret, that Daniel and his fellows should not perish with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. So they had a prayer meeting. That's what this was about. Then was the secret revealed unto Daniel in a night vision. Then Daniel Bless the God of heaven. That's a phrase I want you to, uh, to, to dwell on in your mind. Daniel blessed the God of heaven. Daniel answered and said, here's, his, here's another prayer. This is a prayer of thanksgiving. Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, for wisdom and might are his. And he changes the times and the seasons. He removes kings and sets up kings. We would say in our context, he removes presidents and sets up presidents. He removes governing uh, uh, officials and sets up governing officials. He removes uh, uh, appar uh, apparatus of legislation and he sets up apparatus of legislation. And remember that this is being offered, this prayer of thanksgiving is being offered by a Jewish man, a patriot you could say, who is removed from his home forcibly by an invading empire. Let's pick it up again in verse 21. He gives, God gives wisdom unto the wise, knowledge to them that know understanding. He reveals the deep and secret things. He knows what is in the darkness, and the light dwells with him. I thank thee and praise thee, O thou God of my fathers, who has given me wisdom and might, and has made known unto me now what we desired of thee. For thou hast now made known unto us the king's matter. So Daniel went into Arioch, whom the king had ordered to destroy the wise men of Babylon. He went and said thus unto him, Destroy not the wise men of Babylon, bring me in before the king, and I will show unto the king the interpretation. Then Arioch brought in Daniel before the king in haste and said unto him, now notice this, I have found a man of the captives of Judah that will make known unto the king his interpretation. Arioch has positioned himself for a promotion. You know, uh, he didn't find Daniel, Daniel found him, right? That's what we read. And then the king answered, verse 26, the king answered and said to Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar, are you able to make known unto me the dream which I have seen and the interpretation thereof? And I love, Daniel's one of my heroes. It, it, you should, it, that's easy to pick up on. Here's another reason why. Daniel answered in the presence of the king and said, the secret which the king has demanded cannot the wise men, astrologers, magicians, soothsayers show unto the king. Can you just imagine? I, I, I love to think of, I love to take snapshots of the Bible with the words that you read, and I would love to have a painting of this passage with all the great and the good standing before Nebuchadnezzar and Daniel saying, uh, I know I can't, and Arioch's face going from uh, pink to absolute white. Can you imagine? Because he just said, Daniel's going to do it. He's going to do everything you said. And the king said, can you do it, Daniel? And Daniel said, no, I can't. And I can just imagine the blood drained from Arioch's face because he was going to get killed, he thought, now as well. But verse 28, but there is a God in heaven that reveals secrets and makes known to the king Nebuchadnezzar what shall be in the latter days. Thy dream and the visions of thy head upon thy bed are these. And so then he tells Nebuchadnezzar what his dream is. Now look down in verse 36 with me. And I hope you paid attention to that phrase. It's underlined in my Bible, but there is a God in heaven. Now verse 36, because the preceding verses, he told him what the dream was. Then in verse 36, this is the dream, okay? That was the dream, and now we'll tell you the interpretation thereof, king. Verse 37, thou, O king, are a king of kings, for the God of heaven has given you a kingdom, power, strength, and glory. And then he goes on in to what the uh, interpretation of the dream is. But I want you to focus on Yes, you're a king of kings, old Nebuchadnezzar, and you've conquered all these lands, including our own. But the Lord of heaven, the Lord God of heaven is the one who has placed you in this position and enabled you to enjoy what you're enjoying, who has given you the strength and the power that you have. There is a God in heaven. Now, I, I, I've, wanted to, I, I've wanted to rehearse that with you because I think it's important for us to have those frame of references. Psalm 33 and Daniel chapter 2 and what's going on there as we talk about 
this God-blessed nation. Because one of my favorite tunes, and, and we're going we're gonna to do our best to sing it at the end of the service, but one of my favorite tunes is God Bless America. Do you know the lyrics? God bless America, land that I love. Stand beside her and guide her through the night with the light from above. From the mountains to the oceans, to the, prairie, uh, to the prairies, to the oceans white with foam, God bless America, my home sweet home. You're probably familiar with those lyrics, but you might not know the story behind the lyrics. I want to share that with you really briefly. The, the song, this little song, was written by a fellow named Irving Berlin. who you're, you know, If you like Christmas music, you're familiar with White Christmas. Well, Irving Berlin was a Jew who was born in Imperial Russia. He immigrated in 1893 when he was five years old to the United States with his family. And he wrote this little tune in 1918. If you pay attention to dates and you like history, and I do both, then you know that 1918 was around the time that World War I was, was really getting hot and that you, the United States was about to enter into and had entered into World War I. Irving Berlin dusted off this little tune in 1938 because in 1938, fascism was escalating in Germany and in Italy and totalitarianism was uh, uh, on the rise and in and, uh, and Japan, in the Far East, as Japan was taking over uh, um, all these lands around the Pacific Ocean. And fascism was becoming more and more prominent in the world. And so he dusted off this lyric, uh, this song, and it was used again, especially by a woman named Kate Smith on her radio show, she sang it again for the first time in a long time on Armistice Day. Now, we don't know what Armistice Day is except by what we call it today, Veterans Day. Armistice Day was what it was called. It was to celebrate the end of World War I. We call it Veterans Day today. And for the new ver version, for Kate Smith uh, busting out this song once more on her show on Armistice Day, Berlin included not just the song but an introduction that you may never have heard, but Kate Smith always spoke this introduction before she sang the song, and here it is. While the storm clouds gather far across the sea, let us swear our allegiance to a land that is free. Let us be grateful for a land so fair as we raise our voices in a solemn prayer. And then the solemn prayer is the song, which calls God to stand beside, guide, and bless this nation. And beloved, there is no doubt in my mind that God has indeed blessed this land. God has blessed America. And for that, we should be grateful to him from whom all blessings flow. Tomorrow, July 4th, is the USA's birthday. And as such, is a, is a day of celebration as we celebrate our independence from a tyrannical government and our freedom, the freedom which was purchased by the blood of patriots and granted by the grace of God. America has been, still is, a land of fertile farms, limitless opportunities, and matchless freedoms. America is a blessed nation. And the same is not true for every nation of the world. There are places on this planet where one's next meal is not to be taken for granted. There are places on this planet where there is no real possibility for prosperity. There are places on this planet where speaking or worshiping God cannot take place freely. It has to be done uh, in secret, and you have to be very guarded in what is said. There are places on this planet that it's not safe to raise your children, where there is no clean water, where a good doctor and sanitized hospitals do not exist. And while I recognize that there are some few places within this country where some of that might be true, at least on some level, there is no doubt that the United States of America and the citizens of this land are truly blessed. And that's why people from, whether it's from the south or whether it's from across the oceans, try to come here and, be, and get into this nation either legally or illegally because of the blessings that this nation enjoys, blessings that have been bestowed upon us by God. And, we, and while we won our political independence uh, during the Revolutionary War, we are not independent from the God who has and still does bless our land. God is to be praised for how he has blessed this nation. Now, we read Psalm 33 at the start, and I'll just remind you of that 
most famous verse in that passage that we read. Psalm 33, 12 says, Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord and the people whom he has chosen for his own inheritance. And that passage was originally and is primarily aimed at Israel. Make no mistake about that. But the principle, blessed, and I have the principle up there on the screen, blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. The principle is applicable to any people. And the Christian heritage of the United States of America is undeniable. Just take a cursory study of America's past, and it will show that a majority of Americans shared a common faith or at least a common ethic. And most of America's earliest founders were self-professing Christians, and their documents expressed a belief in a Christian worldview. Fifty-two of the 55 delegates to the Constitutional Convention professed to be Bible-believing Christians. And... Uh, an early and influential study in the democracy uh, 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 in, in, uh, about the United States called Democracy in America, written by the Frenchman Alexis de Tocqueville, said this. I, I, here, here's one of the most famous quotes from that book. There is no country in the world where the Christian religion retains a greater influence over the souls of men than in America. And there can be no greater proof of its utility and of its conformity to, a human, to human nature than that its influence is most powerfully felt over the most enlightened and free nation of the earth. You see, to be a nation of the people, by the people, and for the people, to be a nation that has the freedoms that we enjoy, you have to have a people who, are, who see life through a biblical grid, whether all of them are born-again believers or not. They have to see life through a biblical grid, or that freedom that they will enjoy will implode upon themselves. Um, let me, um, you know, it, it's often been said that America was founded upon an idea, that the country was not formed for power or privilege, but because of a certain set of principles. Let me say that again, that the country wasn't formed for a few to have power and privilege. And what I'm telling you is that the, the Pulitzer Prize winning uh, pro, uh, 1619 project is a lie. And if you're not familiar with that, then you can look that up. Don't do it right now. But the 1619 Project, which won a Pulitzer Prize, written by New York Times columnist, and I forget her name, the, the one, the principal author, but basically said that 1776 is not the founding of this nation, but 1619, when uh, English colonists established Jamestown on the backs of slave labor, and it was all about power and all about privilege. Well, that's not true. This nation was founded on a set of principles. And granted, these ideals have been, at various times in our history, less than ideally maintained. But the ideals remain. The idea persists. Back in Memorial Day, uh, I, I wrote this in my journal. Let me share this with you. I, I'm not going to... Uh, th these are four excerpts from the Declaration of Independence. One, in the very beginning, says that the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and of nature's God entitle, I'm talking about you know, individuals. And then uh, the most famous uh, part of the declaration, which I'll quote in full in a second, says that we are endowed by our creator. And then later on in the declaration, it's, uh, it says that these representatives in general Congress assembled appealing to the supreme judge of the world for the rectitude of our intentions. And then, at the, at the close of the Declaration, and for the support of this Declaration, with a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence, we mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. Four times, four times in the founding document of our nation, there are plain references to God, His sovereignty, and His goodness. And if any one sentence captures the quintessential idea of America, it is that most famous assertion in the Declaration that we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their Creator with certain unalienable rights, and that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Almost every word of this remarkable sentence, 400 and, or 246 years later, is still pregnant with meaning and strikingly relevant. The United States of America began with the conviction that a nation should be founded upon truth. 
Not simply values, not simply preferences, not power or privilege, but upon truths, self-evident truths that were true and are true and will remain true no matter the time, no matter the place, no matter the culture, no matter whether those truths are protected or disrespected. These truths remain. And central among these truths is the belief that all men are created equal. No one possesses more intrinsic worth because they're born rich or because they're born poor. No one has more intrinsic worth because they're born male or born female, artisan or aristocrat, educated or uneducated. And of course, this truth, more than any other, reveals some of the hypocrisy from our history because there were some groups of people who were not treated with equality and dignity at the founding, and another war would have to be waged before that wrong could begin to be remedied. But the truth is still true, right? The truth is still true, and our founding fathers no matter how imperfectly, recognize the truth. We all come into the world with the same rights and the same dignity. Whether, in the world's estimation, we come into this world residing in a super zip. You know what a super zip code is, right? I don't know if you like to read sociological works, but and I forget how long ago this was, but a, a, a sort of conservative writer named Charles Murray uh, in a Washington Post uh, um, uh, editorial uh, coined the phrase super zip code, which is those zip codes in, in the United States that have the largest per capita income with the most college graduation rates. Now, none of those zip codes are in urban areas, but neither are they in rural areas. They are in these suburban areas just outside uh, our, our largest cities, and, and those are where the, the quote-unquote elites reside. And so it doesn't matter. You, you are no more value valuable because you come from a super zip code and you're no less valuable if you come from a rural zip code, right? Make no mistake, these unalienable rights are not granted by the Declaration of Independence or the U.S. Constitution or an elite or an institution of any level. Our rights do not depend upon the government for their existence. They are not owing to the largesse of the state. They're not owing to the might of the military. They're not the blessings of any institution. Our unalienable rights are gifts from God. The creator endows what the state should protect. I want to say that again. The creator endows what the state should protect. And that's why this na that's one of the reasons why this nation is so, so blessed, because our state and I'm not talking about the commonwealth, I'm talking about the nation, our nation has uh, protected these rights. These unalienable rights, they can be suppressed, they can't even be denied, but they cannot be annulled. We possess them by virtue of being created in the image of our creator. Probably the most controversial verse in all of scripture is the first one. In the beginning, God... Those four words uh, uh, can cause all kind of people to get upset. In the beginning, God, and then the, and then the next word is powerful, created. And then what follows in the rest of chapter 1 is he created everything by the very power of his word. He created it from nothing. He spoke into existence. And what we have, we are created in the image of our creator, and as a result, we have certain unalienable rights, and those rights are not the result of what kings or parliaments or presidents or congresses decree or how courts decide. And what are these rights? Well, the Declaration mentions three, and I'll just stick with that right now. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Now, obviously, these rights are not untethered from all other considerations, right? Right? I mean, life should not be lived in a way that means death for others. Liberty has legitimate limits. Our pursuit of happiness should not make others miserable. The Declaration does not call for anarchy. It believes in government, good, limited government, rightly construed, properly constrained, but the rights enumerated are still radical. No matter how young, no matter how old, no matter how tiny, no matter how in utero, no matter how sick, 
Every person, every person deserves a chance at life, liberty, and happiness. And I would say as a pastor, I have to say, as a pastor, one who has been saved and, and who seeks to follow Jesus through his word, and when I say I have to say, don't interpret that as in I wish I didn't have to, but I, I, I must. No, when I say I have to, I am compelled to because of who Christ is and what he has done in my heart and what he has called me to be. Don't hear what I'm not saying. I have to because to not declare what I'm about to declare is to be wrong. It is to miss my calling. It is to fall short of what God has set upon my heart, not just on this day, but every day. And the only way to truly pursue life, liberty, and happiness is to, well, you can look at it with me. Look at it with me in Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, probably sum up the way to uh, enjoy life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness to the absolute fullest extent. And here's what it says. God's word. <laughs> you want to enjoy life? You want to enjoy liberty? You want to uh, pursue happiness? Then let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord, and whatsoever you do, that means everything you do, whether it's in word or in deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. And here's one of the reasons why I had us read Daniel at the start uh, of the preaching time to help frame this discussion. Because Daniel and Hananiah and Mishael and Azariah are Jewish boys who saw their city, their nation, saw it, first of all, uh, turn away from the Lord. They, uh, they were brought into that land when apostasy, when turning away from the, uh, from the godly biblical heritage with which it had been founded, when the nation was so far gone from that, it didn't look like there was any way back. And in fact, for that nation, at that time, there wasn't a way back. The, the book is not closed on Israel yet. Praise God, Jesus Christ, the, uh, the heir of David, is going to reign from Jerusalem. There is coming that millennial kingdom, and praise God for that. But for, but for the time being, the nation was going to be destroyed. And these Jewish young men saw that. They witnessed that as they were carried away captive to Babylon. And many, many, many of their friends and family were killed and destroyed because they weren't considered worthy enough to be carried to Babylon and raised in Babylon and used for the purpose of the Babylonian Empire. And they saw not just their nation destroyed, but they saw the temple of their, of their God destroyed. And they saw the implements of worship that God had de de decreed for the nation of Israel to make. They saw all those implements of worship taken away to Babylon and placed in the houses of false gods. We have a hard time understanding exactly what that would look like because we don't worship that way. We don't uh, uh, live that way. But you need to put yourself in that kind of perspective as best you can. And one by one, they, they, they saw all this happening. And then they get to Babylon, and they see so many of their friends, they see so many of their Jewish friends just say, well, we're here now, we might as well, uh, th this was before Rome, so when in Rome, do as the Romans, well, when in Babylon, do as the Babylons. And right from the beginning, Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not eat the king's meat. And then we get into chapter 2, and God's blessing him, and then we get into chapter 2, and he's about to die along with the other wise men. And we see him faithfully serve his king. A king that he did not vote for, a king that he did not choose, but a king that was thrust upon him. And when you read the rest of the book of Daniel, you see him faithfully serve these emperors and potentates. He found the good and praised it. He cooperated without compromise. He stood up and stood on the word of God and stood out from the rest because of that stand. And that's exactly what we're called to do. And we are so blessed to live in a land that has a blessed 
God-rich heritage. And there's a reason that the founding fathers did not wax eloquent about safety and security. You know, when you read the Declaration, when you read these kind of things, they're not talking about safety and security. They're talking about freedom. They're talking about life and liberty. They're talking about the pursuit of happiness, not about just staying sheltered in a bunker somewhere where you can be safe. You know, uh, you, you know the greatest way to never die in a car accident? Don't ever get in a car, right? But that, that would be kind of difficult, wouldn't it? It's got, you know, there's one way. I, I've been, uh, I fell on a, I've fallen off a horse once. Jeff was there, and so was Bill. And I've been thrown off a horse once. Jeff and Bill were both there. Thankfully, they couldn't record it. They wanted to both times. But that's the benefit of riding with guys who are older than you. They're not as quick on the draw with the uh, cell phone videos. Younger guys can get that out. They just live with it in their hand. Boom, they got it. And it's and before you even get up off the ground, it's on TikTok and Instagram and everywhere else. Not these guys. No, no, there's, there's no pictures of it, but it happened. You know, there's one way to never fall off a horse or get thrown off a horse, right? Don't ever get on one. But then you never get to ride a horse. And so safety and security are not keys anywhere in our founding documents. And that's because our founders believed that freedom and liberty are superior goals, are loftier ideals, and more conducive to the common good. And that's impressive to my mind, and I hope so to yours. Diana and I, in our daily Bible reading, were reading uh, through First Chronicles in the Old Testament, and we came across uh, First Chronicles 19, 13. We've read it plenty of times before. Uh, but it reminded me of this, and, and I'm thankful to God and his providence that it was one of the passages we read leading up to, to today because it reminded me. I, I'm not a big fan of Joab, and I can't get into that story. That's a sermon series for another time. But there's one instance in Joab's life, King David's cousin, where I absolutely stand up and I salute that man. And that's because when they were fighting this massive uh, uh, army that was opposed, the, the Ammonites and the Syrians who were opposed to the, to the people of Israel, King, or, or, uh, General Joab, uh, he came up with a, uh, with a strategy, and here's what he said to Abishai, his brother, who was, the, who was the captain under him. He said, be of good courage, and let us behave ourselves valiantly for our people and for the cities of our God. And, and I love it. It gets even better. And let the Lord do what is right and good in his sight. Honor God and obey God and live, fight, whatever you want to call, for his glory, his way, and whatever he decides and whatever he does and however he plays it out, that's good enough for me. Right? And I praise God for that. One more passage we're going to look at before we, uh, before we conclude this morning. And the plane's coming in. We had a short flight today. And uh, we're coming in, um, Lord willing, we won't have to circle the runway at all. But Proverbs chapter 14, I want you to look with that. I, I told you that's another passage that is typically read uh, during this time of the year. Proverbs 14, 34. It's regularly cited. You may not recognize the address, but you're familiar with the passage. Here's what it says. Righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. Well, I think it would be good for us to regularly meditate on that truth, not just at patriotic holidays, but at all times. But not just verse 34. It's good for us to consider the next verse as well. The king's favor is toward a wise servant, but his wrath is against him that causes shame. Do you know what the root cause of shameful behavior is? The root cause of shameful behavior is often a lack of understanding. And the lack of understanding is usually due to either a lack of instruction or an unwillingness to learn. So there can be nothing, nothing can be taught, and that's going to cause ignorance, and that will lead to shameful behavior. Or the right things can be taught, but people not be willing to learn, and that leads to ignorance or flat-out rebellion and shameful behavior. Now, I've heard it said before that you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make it drink. I've not just heard it said before. I've done that. Riding with these guys, we walk up into the Dix River, 
and it's and it's uh, and it's cool and it's refreshing. I want to jump down uh, in, in the water, but sometimes the horses just don't put their their muzzle down there. They might look down there and sniff it for a second and get up. They're bored with it. You can lead a horse to water, but you can't make it drink. But that doesn't mean that you shouldn't lead the horse to water, right? We must teach others, in our, uh, and particularly the generations that follow ours, who we are by teaching them what we believe and why. And the only way to know who we are is to know our history. President Truman was supposed to have said this. I can't find the, where he said it, but he is supposed to have said, the only new thing in the world is the history you don't know. Whether he said it or not, we need to keep that in mind. And then Lord Bolingbroke, an 18th century political philosopher, is supposed to have said this, history is philosophy taught with examples. And this is true. It's true not only with our national identity, but it's also true when it comes to our Christianity. It's true with our Baptist identity. It's true when it comes to our ministry here and how our ministry stretches out across the globe. Beloved, every time Bible Baptist Church gathers, every time any of Christ's churches gather, every time we gather, we gather to teach and to worship around God's Word. We are studying a document far older and far more important than the Declaration of Independence. We read and study an ancient work, and its value is not just in its antiquity, its value is in its message a message that is inspired by God, the only message that's inspired by God, and therefore it is alive and relevant today in our time just as it was when it was originally written. And as Americans, and as Americans of this age, we are extremely blessed. Yes, in many ways the days seem dark. I get that. In many ways, uh, we can see maybe no light at the end of the tunnel, but we should not allow the fear of man to shroud our eyes. We have a great door of gospel opportunity stretched out before us. We are blessed with resources and opportunities that past generations of believers in this nation, past generations of believers in our church could not have totally fathomed. And we need to continue to take advantage of our opportunities and continue to press on toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus as we stand fast in one spirit with one mind together for the faith of the gospel. So let's responsibly use our freedom. I love to think about freedom that way. Freedom equals responsibility. Freedom is not just about me being able to do what I want, however I want, you know, yippee, I'm an American, I got all these freedoms. Freedom means responsibility. And so let's use our freedom responsibly. Freedom that is granted by the grace of God, purchased with the blood of our patriots, protected by those who serve and keep the peace even today. Because we understand that blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. Let's never forget that we have been wonderfully independent from England since 1776. Yeah, I mean, I think we probably don't have a greater friend in all the world as a nation. Praise God for that. But while we have been wonderfully independent from England since 1776, we are wholly dependent on God. We were at the beginning, and we will be. We are now, and we will be for always. And I understand, I don't know what some of you here this morning or some of you watching, uh, if you pay attention to social media, and I pay attention to it less and less uh, uh, than I did even a, a few years ago, uh, and for good reason, I think. But I, I, there's all kind of debate. You, you should, uh, you know, um, some of you may think I've been foolish for even talking about these things or whatever else this morning. And I understand the dangers of an unthinking an unthinking God and country mentality. I also understand the dangers of a gospel-less civil religion. But I also think love of country, like love of family or love of work, is a proximate good. And this is the country in which God in his sovereignty 
decided to set me down. I didn't discover the world in Mexico or Croatia or Russia. I discovered the world in March of 1973 in the United States of America, and praise God for that. And patriotism is not beneath the Christian, even for citizens of this superpower. So on this Independence Day holiday, I'm thankful, not just for my land, but I'm thankful most of all for the cross of Christ and the freedom that we have from the world, from the flesh, and from the devil. I'm also thankful for this country, thankful for the big drops of biblical truth that seeped into the bloodstream of our founders, like Thomas Jefferson, even though when you read that man, I'm not, I'm not convinced that that man actually trusted in Christ as Savior, but I'm thankful for the biblical truth that he understood and that shaped his writing. I'm thankful for imperfect ideals. I'm thankful for God-given rights and hard-fought liberty. I'm thankful for the idea of America, and along with an immigrant Jew, I pray, God bless America, land that I love. So I'm going to ask you to stand with me, and I'm going to ask Sean to come up here, and however we're going to sing it. Are we going to sing a cappella? Yeah. Sean's going to come up here, and we're going to sing this song a cappella. And here's, here's the first thing we're going to do. In just a second, we're going, to, uh, we're going to say this. I want you to follow along with me. I'm going to lead us. We're going to say this. Now, the storm cloud, there are still storm clouds far across the sea, but we've got greater storm clouds right here in our nation. But let's just read it uh, as it's written, and then, Sean, you take us through it, and you follow him however many times he leads us through it, if it's once or twice or whatever, you follow him as he leads us through it, and then uh, I'll close us uh, in, in a word of prayer. Um, but let's, are you ready? Let's quote this together. You follow me. While the storm clouds gather far across the sea, let us swear allegiance to a land that's free. Let us all be grateful for a land so fair as we raise our voices in a solemn prayer. God bless America. If you're happy about that, say amen. amen. Let's go ahead and be dismissed from word of prayer. I'm going to remind you, tonight the teens are going to lead the service. I know that tomorrow's the 4th and there's stuff probably down in town and all that jazz, but be here tonight if you can and, and support our teens as they share with us what God did uh, and will continue to do with them through camp this last week. Remember our prayer request. Keep William especially in your prayers. He's right now on his way up to get his COVID test for his surgery uh, prior to his surgery on Tuesday. Let's pray again. Father in heaven, we thank you for your goodness to our land. And we thank you for your blessings. And help us to remember the one from whom all blessings flow. And help us to understand that when there are dark clouds, when there are hard times, and, and we've, we've weathered some of them now, and our nation has from the very beginning. There's, there have been times when the skies have been bright, but not all the time and not even most of the time. But Father, you are a good and a great God. And may we uh, be thankful for our founding documents and the principles upon which this nation was built and, the, and the, uh, the courage and the patriotism and the freedoms that we enjoy. But Father, may we never look past you when we consider these things. May we recognize who you are. And may we also, Father, be humbled and not think ourselves better 
as if uh, somehow we are better than other nations in the world who have not and who do not enjoy the freedoms that we have. Father, there is such a thing as being better off and not being better than. And, and as the declaration states, which is true to biblical truth, we are all created equal. Whether we're better off or not, we are all created equal in your sight. And that's true of every ethnicity, every language group, every, nation, uh, every uh, nation state. So, Father, uh, as we rejoice in what we have, may we be humble because of who has given it and recognize that it's not because we are deserving of it in and of ourselves, but because you are a good God. And so may we see our freedom as a vehicle for responsibly and consistently proclaiming your good news. And it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. You're dismissed.